Oh, what a joy it is to be near my home. I was just with uh, Carter G. Woodson this morning. And I was telling him, you know where I'm going? I'm going home. I'm going home because some women decided to do something in September instead of February. <laughs> for lifting us up and allowing us to be in this space. So God's evening to you. I am Miss Nanny Helen Burroughs. I was never married. I was married to my work. And I must give honor to God for everything that I did. Everything that I said. Everything that I wrote. And everything that I read. I give it to him. I was merely, merely his vessel, merely his messenger, merely one who was called to do his work on planet Earth. And so, you heard I was born in Orange, not too far from here, in the year of 1879. I was the child of formerly enslaved children. You see, my grandparents on both sides were enslaved. My mother, Miss Jenny Poindexter, I'd like to refer to her as a domestic engineer. <laughs> she was an excellent cook. She was literate. She taught Sunday school. My father, John Burroughs, was a trained mechanic, a farmer, and attended what you now know as Virginia Uni Union, and he was a preacher, an itinerant minister who traveled around here in the state of Virginia delivering God's word. But the one I want to tell you about is my grandmother, Maria Poindexter, who never looked down at the ground. She always held her head high because she said we ain't no hung down head race. Right. They may have enslaved my body, but they did not enslave my mind. My grandmother taught me racial pride, self-determination, and a little bit of folk wisdom. And that's what I went on to teach many others. And so my parents did value education, as you can see. I had a little sister, and my mother made a decision after my father's death, and also because of his rather irresponsible behavior, that we would leave this area when I was five years old and moved to the fair city of Washington, D.C. It was there that she knew I could get a quality education. I developed typhoid fever, so I missed a lot of years of school. But I want you to know I graduated on time from the right. Street School in Washington, D.C., known later as the Paul Lawrence Dunbar School. And it was there that I met two women, Anna Julia Cooper, and Mary Church Terrell. These two women were my teachers. And Ms. Cooper taught me that you are your sister's keeper. And it was with that imprinted on my heart that I made up my mind upon graduation that I was going to teach school. I was going to impart information, wisdom, learning, and how to take care of yourself to women and girls. And so I did. I went on to graduating. And I applied for a job in the D.C. public school system. Do you think I got it? No. <laughs> because as you can see, I was a little browner when I was here the last time. <laughs> and Washington, D.C. has what we call a fair skin aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And they also have a thing about pedigree, what your connections are, who you're related to, and all of that. And my parents had none of that. But I'm not going to let anybody turn me around. That's right. I'm not going to run with my tail tucked between my legs. Right. And so what I did was go on and work for the church in Pennsylvania and in Kentucky. In Kentucky, I rented a house and I started something called the Women's Industrial Club. And it was there that women made lunches for the colored laborers. They went out and they sold them in brown paper bags. And I allowed these women to come and teach classes, te take classes for me for 10 cents a week where they could learn how to sew. They could learn a little accounting. They could learn how to type in some stenography and learn how to take care of their homes. It was my idea 
that while we were enslaved, we were what? We were servants. So, why abhor service when you can professionalize it? Because I knew that people were going to leave trained, intelligent women with coop who could take care of their homes, take care of their children, and also work in those nice offices in D.C. and on Capitol Hill. So I made my way back to Washington, finally, after I had spent a lot of time and energy traveling this country, raising money and talking and organizing women. I formed, with the help of others, the Women's Auxiliary of the National Baptist Convention because I was a Baptist all my life. We started with only 300 women. In three years, we had over a million and a half women. I also organized many clubs. One of was my dear sister, Mary McLeod Bethune, who you will hear from later, where we worked to organize the domestic workers so they could receive a fair wage. Yes. Well, after getting all these women organized, came to D.C., found me a piece of land. I understand Booker T. Washington wanted to buy it for his daughter. I'm like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I bought that piece of land on God's holy hill in Northeast Washington, and I bought it with a $1,000 down payment that I raised from women all over this country. Yes. We opened the National Training School for girls in 1909 with 31 girls. I graduated I love with it. industry the way to make a living, but they also had a classical education. They learned how to speak. They learned how to write. They did poetry. They danced. They had music. And I'm going to tell you one thing they had, and they had a test on it. And that was Negro history. Because my brother Carter G. Woodson loaned all of the books from his library to my school so my girls could get a good man. you can imagine. They garden, they did everything. And then eventually, eventually, I made a decision. I'm going to go on and I'm going to raise money in different kinds of ways. So I organized these girls and they traveled the country. They danced, they sang, they did plays. And I continued to work with the church because I wasn't going to let the church disappoint me. They didn't want to help me with the school. They chose not to. But I kept that school open. And even in the depression, when I needed money desperately, Finally, I started asking white folks for money. <laughs> and John D. Rockefeller, I wrote him a letter. You know who he was. I said, Mr. Rockefeller, would you please support my school? He read me back a letter. Miss Burroughs, if I gave you a dollar, what would you do with it? I said, I would buy a bag of peanuts, shell them, roast them, send them back to you, have you side them, and then I would sell them. <laughs> <laughs> that man gave me some money. <laughs> Money. I did some white philanthropist money, but I also did a lot of other things. I wrote in the Pittsburgh Courier and other black papers. I was a columnist. I went around the country speaking one year. I think I made about 350 speeches. I wrote 12,000 letters. And I worked with 156 different clubs, because you know clubs is how women organize back in the day. I'm so grateful for my life and my work. I also did a little thing with the school. We need to make some money, so I went to Herbert Hoover. And I said, let us do your laundry. We had a laundry in the school. We taught the girls how to do laundry. They made shoes. So we did the laundry during the Depression. We only shut for a little while. So my work was the National Training School for Girls. But my effect was far, far greater. I think you all know about the 12 things I said a Negro should do. I want you to know I also wrote some of the 12 things white folks shouldn't do. <laughs> that didn't bring quite as much play. <laughs> things I would like to say is this. God is good. And God puts on your heart a longing if you choose to make a difference in the world. He did that for me and he'll do it for you. He did it for my girls and he did it for all of the lives that they touched. So I'm going to leave you on one thing because I know my time is running short. And that is this. There is no race problem. It's just a problem of justice and injustice. White people, 
I want you to know it. We don't need your teachers. We have our own teachers. Tell it. Tell it. We don't need your preachers. We have our own preachers. Speak, speak. We don't need your clothes or your furniture. We have our own clothes. Hear me. All we need is a fair chance. Tell it. That's all we need. We need it then and we need it now. The other thing for my colored friends, we must chloroform our Uncle Tom. <laughs> we cannot allow those folk who are out here Tell it. turning on us, Tell it. petting us Tell it. in the church, Tell it. in the school, and everywhere else, chloroform them. Get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> But in my day, I would tell them, brother, you can marry that white woman if you want to, but get out, good riddance. <laughs> and the other thing I said, it was quite controversial, and I'll say it here. Slavery was a success. And do you know why? Because it made us hardworking. It gave us a place to be, and I know America owes a lot to us. Yeah. Our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents, they already paid for our education. Yeah. And for all the people they brought us in the workhouse, and in the jail, and in the penitentiary, you will rise up to where you're supposed to be. Mm. To God be the glory. We came through slavery, thousands of us were enslaved, but millions of us are free. Yeah. Yeah. And to be the great democracy that the experiment was intended to be. So on that note, I will leave you and I'll say God bless you. Keep on keeping on. Don't be afraid to stand up for what you need. Fight against what we fought against in my day, the lynching, which y'all had the shooting. Fight against our children being ignorant and not having respect.